Hello, hello, welcome to Quackalope, and today we're covering one of my favorite deck building games ever, Dale of Merchants. Now, Dale of Merchants 3 is currently on Kickstarter, and I have a production prototype here in front of me. So, if you're familiar with the Dale of Merchants series, here in just a bit, we're going to go through the six new decks introduced in this box and talk about the strategic principles around them. So hold tight. Now, the reason I can say Dale of Merchants is one of my favorite deck building games of all time is because it's existed for a little while. We have the starting Dale of Merchants, we have Dale of Merchants 2, and we have Dale of Merchants the Collection. Each one introduces new animal factions, new decks, new mechanics, new ways to mix and match this deck building experience. And so I'm working on a second video to go alongside this coverage of Dale of Merchants 3. This video will be more specific on how the game flows, the gameplay mechanics themselves, and diving more specifically into the strategy around these new decks. So you can either pick up this brand new copy, it's a self-contained game that can be added to any of the others, but doesn't require the others in order to play. Or, if you're already experienced, we'll have a deep discussion around what this will add to your entire collection, bringing, I think, your total decks up to something like 27 unique animals, mechanics, and factions and ways of mixing and integrating these decks together. And I'll explain what that all means here in just a second. But we're working on a second video, a full right for you, wrong for you video that covers the collection as a whole. Just in case you're similar to me and you tend to go all in when you think you're really gonna like something, or if you just wanna determine if Dale of Merchants as a core series, as a core concept, is the type of game that you would be interested in. So watch this video, but keep your eyes out for that other right for you, wrong for you as well. Along with that, if you're new here, I'm Quackalope. Thank you for being here. We produce aggressively high quality video content, gameplay reviews, unboxings, Kickstarter previews, a whole arsenal of stuff, along with a interview with Sami Lasko, the designer of Dale of Merchants himself, which I will link down in the description down below. So if you're interested in learning more around the creative mind around this game, go click on that link and, and check out that hour long interview. And finally, if you're already here because you are familiar with what we do, I have a very important and special announcement that I would like to make. There is a poll currently up and running, giving us the opportunity to bring in a duck into the world of Dale of Merchants. Now, one of the hero cards, one of the character cards here in the collector's edition does have two ducks on them already. So it won't be the first time a duck's been introduced, but it'll be the first time our community brings in a duck. So down in the description down below, there's going to be a link to a form where you can fill out four different animal types. All I ask is that you go there and you take the time to enter duck into the feathered beasts category so that we might strike a chance of making a duck from Quackalope an official part of one of my favorite games. That would genuinely, uh, genuinely that would blow me away. Whatever the case, let's go ahead and start getting into what Dale of Merchants is, into the setting, the theme, and the mechanics of this game. And then we'll dive into, like I said, the core mechanics of each one of these cards. So like any good Quackalope video, I'll start off with just a bit of flavor text to set the stage before we, we really get started. Folk and freight must keep moving. While transportation by sea is fast, navigating around the entire continent isn't. Many destinations are inaccessible by ships. A solution is on its way, as inland countries welcome a new invention into their territories, a railway. The Continental Transport Corporation was founded to expand the railway network across Africa. The final say on the track's path and construction lays on the shoulders of the railway manager, an open position to be filled. With a handful of talented merchants, the board of directors is holding a trading competition to choose the manager. Prospects are free to use almost any means in order to gain the upper hand over their fellow competitors. So that is the setting for Dale of Merchants. Dale of Merchants is a world where humans didn't develop into the sentient kind of beings that we are, right? The ability to question life and innovate and design and, and craft the world around us. But instead, all of the animal kind did it in their own unique way. We have the archiving desert monitors, the prepared grizzled tree kangaroos, the superstitious snow hares, the sharing short-beaked echidnas, the scheming green magpies, and the discontent white-headed lemurs. And these are some of the animals that exist in this game. 
they have their own cultures and tribes and ways of interacting with the world, and in a lot of ways, these animal kind reflect upon the diversity in society that we have here across the world. And so you'll see elements shine through from the regions they come from or the cultures they in some ways inhabit and represent. But they each carry with them their own unique traits. And gathered together, a small subsection of this world are going to be the master traders. The individuals from these communities that are the, the most highly skilled at using the resources and the tricks that they have on hand to build and display the best of everything they have to offer everything all tribes have to offer. They're traders, and they're doing their very best to build a successful merchant stall before anyone else in the game. So I guess it's time for me to start breaking down exactly how you play. In a game of Dale of Merchants, you'll be shuffling these animal decks together based on how many people you have engaged in a game. It's always one more than the number of players, and it's a two to four player game. So in a two player game, like I often play, you'd be playing with three unique decks. Now, each of these decks have different mechanics or different ways that they interact with each other. For instance, the sharing short-beaked echidnas are carefree swappers. They hand off cards and return cards from other players, always trading one for one, always doing sort of a fair exchange rate. Or you have the scheming green magpies. They're pompous professionals. They very specifically will steal cards, but only if they can get the identifiable number or term right. So they are very particular about what they take, but if they're able to identify what they're looking for, they will take it without a second thought. So these decks each have these unique mechanics all the way through them, all the way through the piles of different cards. You'll shuffle three of these decks together in a two-player game, and each player will start with a generic, sort of standard unit. After that, you'll have a marketplace spread out in front of you where cards start flipping up and you'll be using the top action here to purchase from that marketplace. As you purchase, you're gonna be adding cards from that marketplace directly into your hand, giving you a significant amount of control when it comes to a deck building game. From there, you'll be using actions, chaining actions together if it has a little plus side here or if it's a technique, using some passive abilities unique to each character type, and doing your very best to build your market stall. Your market stall is going to contain a row of eight cards, starting with the number one value, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, by chaining together different animal types. So for instance, this one here with the carefree swapper would be free to go there, or this two would continue building my stall in appropriate way. But if we were playing with the hairs as well, maybe I would then chain together a two and a one to make a three. So I'm building my stall, trying to be the first player to get the whole way up to a number value of eight while manipulating those numbers and crafting things that pair together. But these are also the cards that you need in your hand in order to engage with the marketplace or trade cards with another player or just continue your turn. And as you place them into your stall, they stop being effective cards for you to use. So the decision between when you leave something out of your hand, when you remove it from the game, and when you continue playing, trying to pull from that market stall, trying to buy as much as quickly and effectively as you can, becomes a really salient part of this game. Overall, this game is easily one of the most modular deck building games I've ever discovered. These characters range in a variety of different scales, from how much luck they introduce to the game, how much coolness or meanness do they introduce, how much direct player interaction, whether it is mean direct interaction or nice, friendly direct interaction, like the carefree swappers here, the, uh, the sharing short-beaked echidnas. There's variable skills, and as you're crafting a game to play, you can play based around the type of experience you want to have. Do you want a high amount of randomness and luck? Do you want to be rolling dice and seeing what happens and existing in a crazy hand over fist swapping arena? Or would you prefer a really heavy challenging game with almost no luck, almost no randomness at all? Dale of Merchants is a card game that allows you to control for all of that, especially when you have the full collection. All 27 decks give you, I mean, an incalculable amount of variations on this game you can play. And I would argue in a way that there is certainly a version of this game that is going to be correct for the vast majority of people who are willing to play deck building games. Because it just structures itself in a way that makes it so unique and so 
controllable for your personal experience. It's one of the reasons I find it so fascinating, and it's also one of the reasons why I've loved to get it to the table with Jan. I absolutely adore this experience. So if you've made it to this part, hopefully I've given you a run through and an understanding of what exactly this game is. Let's go ahead and start breaking down exactly what our new character types do. And I'll pull one or two cards to show them off uh, as effectively as I can. So starting here with the sharing short beaked echidnas. Now these are going to be carefree swappers. I've got a little bit of flavor text over here as well. Echidnas borrow cards from everyone. Their only saving grace is the fact that they always leave something as a replacement. Add them in when you want a lot of interaction between players without straight out stealing. So this is gonna be a deck that allows you to interact across the table, taking cards from other players throughout the course of the game, but it doesn't do it in a mean way, and certainly not in a take that way at all. You see, the premise of the Echidnas is that you're always giving something in return for what you're taking. And in fact, because these cards can be used by anyone at the table, you're always giving them the opportunity to do the same exact thing, to take from you or take from another player that's playing at the table. So starting here with the top technique. Swap this card with a top card from another player's discard pile. Place the new card in your hand. So this one pops in, you take the top card, and you've swapped, but you've given them the opportunity to do the exact same thing. Let's go a little deeper here. We have Delicacies. Draw two cards from another player's deck. You may swap this card with one of them, placing the new card in your hand. Then that player shuffles the two cards into their deck. Now again, you might be taking a card that is of high value to them, but you're also giving them a three value card that has a technique that they can then utilize if they would like. Or one of these powerful cards here in the end. Matching colors. Swap an, anal swap an animal folk card from your hand with a card of equal value from the stack in another player's stall. So you're not removing anything from their stall. In fact, you're not even decreasing the value specifically. Instead, you're just handing a card off for a card that you might want to utilize. You're just giving yourself an opportunity. You're not taking anything away from them. So that's the sharing short-beaked echidnas. Then we have the superstitious snow hares. Making predictions. Statistics and calculations or blind trust in beliefs from previous generations. Hares introduce luck, but you can do a lot to play around with these precise timing and careful preparations. Anytime you roll a hair die and get the result of a galaxy, you may choose to re-roll the die to change your result. So hairs are going to introduce an element of luck and randomness into the game, but they also give you a reasonable amount of control and a high payoff if you're able to utilize that luck for your own advantage. So starting here with the basic unit, draw a card from your deck and place it into your hand, then roll the die. Discard two cards from either your hand, from nowhere, or from your deck. So you get to draw something, but, but you might be doing so at the cost of your own cards or some other cards that you need. We have Bad Omen. Draw three cards from your deck. You may throw away one of them. Place the rest back in any order. This allows you to control the top of your deck and potentially allows you to get rid of junk or get rid of cards that just don't mean much for you to use, cycling your deck and making it a little bit more efficient. And then one of these last cards here, we have the Celestial Guidance. Roll the hair die. Search a card from nowhere, your deck, or your discard pile, and place it into your hand. And then if you search from your deck, you get to shuffle your deck. So you're spending an action, you're using a technique, it's an expensive card, but if you get it right, you get to choose exactly what you want out of your deck. You get to control kind of that element. So there's a lot of luck there, but there's also a lot of opportunity to really take advantage of the current situation. Next we have the prepared grizzled tree kangaroo, who is a clever guardian. Stashing and protecting. Kangaroos are excellent at hiding their valuables and creating diversions for mischief makers. However, their techniques are useful even when no one is playing dirty. So what that means is this is going to give you a lot of opportunities to control and Hold on to cards that you know you want to keep, especially if you're playing with things like the magpies or the echidnas. You're going to make it impossible for them to take cards from you. But it also gives you a lot of control over your deck and over your hand. So even if you're not playing with cards that 
create direct player interaction, these guys will give you a reasonable amount of control and a reasonable amount of way to ensure that what you want is there when you want it. So starting here with the basic guardian. Store, one card from your hand. At the start of your next turn, place that stored card into your hand. So you're just setting it on the table, getting it out of your hand, and then returning it to when it is time. We have the barricade. After filling your hand, you may search your discard pile for up to two junk cards and place them into your hand. So you're filling your hand with a lot of randomness. You're going over your hand limit and you're ensuring that there is a higher likelihood that someone is pulling a useless card from your hand instead of the cards that you specifically want or need. And then one of these ending abilities here, tactical measurement. You may draw one card from your deck and place it into your hand once on your turn. If you do so, place one card from your hand on top of your deck. So this is just a passive ability that works as long as you have this card in your hand. And what you'll be doing is you'll just be swapping, maybe restoring, maybe placing a card that you know you want next turn onto the top of your deck so you can ensure you get it and getting something out of your hand that someone else might be wanting to interact with or draw up. Moving up top here, we have the archiving desert monitors who are rigorous chroniclers. So let's see what we have. Discard Mastery. Monitors excel at manipulating their discard piles. Do you have great cards in your discard, useless junk in your deck? Even a beginner will have the right cards in place at the right time after taking a lesson from the monitors. So the monitors are going to excel at allowing you to control and filter through your discard pile, letting you pull things back into your hand that you might have already used or that you know you need quicker than you'd naturally get them. So starting here with the very top one. When you use this card to purchase, you may decide its value, one through three. A little bit of a uh, benefit there in terms of your starting card giving you a range of value. Normally, you can't overpay for an item. In this situation here, you can do exactly that in a way, or you can do it precisely. We have a refreshing drink. You may discard one card from your hand once in your turn. So allowing you to cycle things out of your hand into your discard pile, allowing you to draw back up, moving that deck along a little bit faster. Here we have a duplicate entry. Search your deck. You may throw away a card from there. Shuffle your deck. This allows you to clean out things like junk or other cards that are just getting in the way. And then finally, we have cultural preservation. Search your deck for up to three cards. Place one into your hand and discard the rest. Shuffle your deck. Again, this is going to allow you to move through your deck faster, deal with the cards in your discard pile, control what is going into there, and then hopefully continue progressing kind of through that circle. And there's some other cards in there that directly deal with drawing from or pulling from the discard pile specifically. Next, we have the discontent white-headed lemurs who are voracious consumers. Replacing cards. Lemurs are rather impatient and get tired of their items faster than anyone else. Getting rid of old cards and trying out new things is second nature to them. Don't get too attached to your cards and introduce the lemurs to your game. So the lemurs are going to excel at getting rid of everything in their hand, just like Jan gets rid of all the games on his shelf. He is an expert at trading games away, and the lemurs do just that as well. They're going to be getting cards that they use one or two times and then immediately swapping those cards for other cards, either from the marketplace or from other players. So starting here at the top, shuffle your discard pile into your deck, immediately letting you cycle what's in your discard pile and getting it back into the swing of things. We have a delightful surprise. Draw two cards from the market deck and place one into your hand, then throw away the other and this card. So you're trashing this card, but you might be able to pull one of those exclusive cards that you specifically want, and who really wants that specific card anyway? We have a fortunate upgrade. Throw away a card from your hand, draw one card from the market deck, and place it into your hand. Immediately starting to cycle cards. You don't want this anymore, you want that. And you're just grabbing and taking and shifting. And then finally, we have royal privilege. When you use this card to purchase, you may throw away an animal folk card from your hand to purchase one additional card, pay only one for that card. So you're reducing the price of the market. You're kind of taking something along with you as you go shopping. You know, who, uh, who needs to play by all the rules? 
And then finally, the last deck we want to go over are the Scheming Green Magpies, who are pompous professionals. Let's see here. Guessing and Stealing. Magpies are choosy thieves. They try to steal only specific items and nothing more. You need to keep an eye on your opponents if you want to utilize magpies to their full potential, for advanced players only. Magpies are going to be targeting and specifically trying to take advantage of cards and characters in another player's deck or in their discard pile. You're going to be stating and then drawing, hoping that you get exactly what you're looking for because they're very peculiar. They're not interested in anything outside of the exact term or the exact name you gave them. So starting here with the top unit, name a set, draw three cards from your deck and show them. Place one card of the named set into your hand and shuffle the rest back. Okay, so if you can find exactly what you're looking for, they'll help you take advantage of it. Bribe. When you use this card to purchase, your hand size is increased by one for this turn. Not bad, allowing you to carry a little bit more. Here's where it starts to get a little nasty. Grasp. Choose one random card from another player's hand. If you guess its value, place it into your hand. So if I know you have a four, or a three, or a one, I might just be able to reach over and take that with me. And then finally we have a Sudden Nap. Throw away one random card from another player's hand. It's not the card I wanted, so uh, we're going to get rid of it. That's the Scheming Green Magpies. They are, like the rules say, for experienced players only because it deals with a lot of direct strategy and knowing the card terms and, and names specifically. But they also add a level of sort of meanness and take thatness, which in a game like this, if you're a type of player that enjoys that style of deck building games, sets you up for a really interesting and, and hopefully fun experience. So that's an overview of Dale of Merchants 3, all the new decks that get introduced into this. If you've made it to this point, hopefully we've helped you determine if this is a game that is right for you, or if you already are in love with the Dale of Merchants collection, then hopefully I've been able to show off what is coming in this new core set and get you excited about the different ways you're going to be able to combine them with everything else. So I have two questions for the audience. First, if you're brand new to Dale of Merchants, what type of animals would you like to see exist in this space? And second, if you're already a fan of Dale of Merchants, thinking back through these cards and these decks that I've introduced, what strange or weird combinations would you like to play with from the other core sets here? I'd love to hear some examples that maybe we'd get to test out on the channel down the road. Jan will be coming back down here very soon and I'm excited because there is no way we are not doing a gameplay of this. We've both kind of been itching to do this and to do Everdell and potentially to get some more root on the table. So be expecting those videos here on the channel soon. And if you're brand new to Quackaloop and you've made it to this point, please take the time to hit that subscribe button down below. It allows you to stay connected with us, see the content that we put up every single week uh, and just sort of stay in the circle as we cover new games in our own unique way. Whatever you do though, whatever the case, remember to do the important thing, get out and play some games. We'll see you next time.